When I tell people that I am writing the story of a bloodied and broken brain, and oh, by the way, there will be recipes too, <laughs> I get some strange looks. Food is not supposed to top the list of things you think about, apparently, when you're recovering from a near-fatal brain explosion. The thing is, I did think about food a lot, and it's not really all that strange. I start this story here on the floor of the conference center gym, because it now seems the most obvious place. But it wasn't obvious to me then that a start had occurred at all. I thought my fall from the treadmill was a dot on a plot line already underway. The one about the literature student at a conference who fainted, missed the morning's events, got checked out, and returned, red-faced and sheepish, in time for lunch. I was running on the treadmill when I felt a painless click in my head. There was an odd trickling sensation along my skull like a rolling bead of sweat but on the inside. Then the room went gray and the earth sucked me down. I didn't know then that when I slipped from that moving belt, that dot had also slipped and become its own point A. There was a surgery to repair the ruptured brain aneurysm and during that surgery and the surgeries that followed, um, I lost my sense of smell, which ultimately came back. I lost the vision in my left eye, which did not come back. And I developed um, an infection in the tissue surrounding my brain. Um, and it got into my skull, and there was a piece of bone um, at the top of my, um, my left uh, forehead right here, um, my left temple and the top of my head. Um, it became so diseased that the doctors, when they went in to scrape out the infection, had to remove that chunk and throw it away. And um, I lived that way, missing that part of my skull for um, a year, uh, at the end of which um, there was a, a cranioplasty, a surgery to, to put it back together again, now with a prosthetic piece. My dad called, uh, dubbed that, that day, that day, that surgery day, Humpty Dumpty Day, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, uh, they actually, they, they gave me this medically prescribed hockey helmet to wear um, in, in the meantime, which was really quite a luck. Most people, when an aneurysm ruptures in their brain, they die. Um, and then the people who don't, uh, most, of, most of the survivors have some kind of lasting uh, permanent deficit or uh, disability. I escaped all that, but I started to wonder when I couldn't read, um, you know, am I perhaps brain damaged after all? Or could it be that um, this is just the, the lack of concentration that they said might stick around for six to eight months? There's a chapter in my book called Home is a Verb. And it's about how home isn't only where we live, but how. So I decided to start a blog. I named it Sweet Almondine. I wanted something Almondine, something almond flavor, because I wanted to do honor to a cake called Marcella's Butter Almond Cake, which is actually the first recipe in this book. And I love this cake, um, I realized, um, because it reminded me of, um, when I was little in New York City, you know those, um, the Amaretti cookies and the red tins. So I ate those cookies when I was very little and I write about them uh, in one of the early chapters and how um, they and this cake, that, that, that sense of, um, I think I write that I didn't aspire to be a grown up when I was a kid, but I liked being a kid who enjoyed grown up things. And I think that those cookies fell into that category for me. So I decided that Sweet so Amandine would be an aneurysm free zone. I told uh, my family and friends I'm not going to mention my aneurysm on the blog or my illness. Um, I want, this is my way of saying I'm ready to talk about something else now. Thinking about food means thinking about everything that goes on around it. The dash from the breakfast table out the door, the conversations that shape us, the places and faces that make us who we are. What besides food could I think of that would encompass my life so roundly? Illness takes away plenty of big things. You can't work, you can't play. Worst of all, though, is the way it robs you of your everyday. That's true. Whether you're sick for three months or three days, if you've ever had a shower after a fever breaks, a first bite of solid food, traded your bathrobe for your favorite sweater, then you felt it too. Getting well means finding your everyday. I found mine in the kitchen. Just having a project, um, having a being able to do something generative when I felt so um, useless and fragile um, really meant something. Then, you know, the, there was the physical aspect of being in the kitchen. I mentioned that I lost the vision in my left eye and that that uh, loss of, of sight is permanent. Um, but my a neurosurgeon had told me, and he was right, that uh, slowly over time um, my brain would remap itself and I would barely notice the deficit. The deficit being, um, when you lose vision in one eye, uh, is a deficit in depth perception. Uh, 
uh, depth perception is a binocular phenomenon at close range, um, which means if, like me, only have one eye at the beginning, you know, I'd have my mug of tea, I'd go to put it down on the table, and it would go crashing to the floor. In the kitchen, this was interesting when I was cooking, because at first I would be cracking eggs onto the counter instead of the bowl. Um, I had my, you know, I had my hockey helmet, I'd be going to stir something and clunk against the, the hood of the oven. Being in the kitchen and then writing about it allowed me to notice the little bits of normalcy that were starting to sprout up all around me um, and help me to believe in them again and then through writing to, to, to really register um, them. You know, I say something at some point in the book about frying an egg. You know, to fry an egg is a statement of, of uh, faith that you're going to be there in a few minutes to sit down and eat it. <laughs> and to season it with salt and pepper is to say that you're going to do so according to your taste. <laughs> and this whole notion of according to your taste, you know, to feel my preferences exert themselves, to, to have taste. This just, it, it was like an awakening after, as I said, other people had been managing all of that uh, for me for so long. I had gotten to the point where I no longer was thinking about my illness as a before and an after. And I realized that stir was really the best verb to describe what had happened to me. I compare it to a pile of leaves, a wind blows and it picks them up and puts them back down again. And it's the same pile, but the leaves have been just shifted in their position. Food, like art, like music, brings people together, it's true. It begins though with a private experience. A single person stirred, moved, and wanting company in that altered state. So we say, you have to taste this. We say, please take a bite. It is a pleasure not only to taste, but to have taste, to feel our preferences exert themselves. It feels good to know what we like, because that's how we know who we are. Thank you.